Hey, hey everybody, Z Garcia here. Welcome back to Board Game Blender. On today's episode, which we are calling Reduce, and there will be a series, Reduce, Reuse, and of course, Recycle. We are talking about games that do a lot with very few components. Games that you can pack into a small space, and you are still going to get a big game experience oftentimes, but with just very few components. Oftentimes they'll have cards that have multi-use purposes, but I, I love this idea. I love the idea that we are able now to have components in a game that serve multiple purposes, a game that feels like it allows for a lot of intricacy, a lot of sort of different avenues of play, with just a handful of components. So I hope you find a few new favorites here, at least maybe something you haven't heard about before. And if like me and many gamers, you are having a hard time finding games that you can fit onto your overcrowded shelves anyway, then maybe some of these will be good suggestions for you. Anyway, let's kick it off right away. I hope you enjoy the episode and I'll see you in just a little bit. Hi everyone, Andrew and Jess from Gameosity here, and today we're taking a look at the Manhattan Project Chain Reaction. So the original Manhattan Project is a pretty fully featured worker placement game. It's a pretty robust game in general. It's got three different kinds of workers, two different uh, resources, and players are racing to be the first to complete a series of nuclear warheads that will earn them points. And they'll do that by sending their workers to a bunch of different places on the board, potentially blocking each other. There's a lot of contention. You can send spy planes over to mess with people, destroy other people's factories, all kinds of junk. This, on the other hand, is a deck of cards. Yeah, but you still get the same experience. You're still going to be having workers, you know, um, getting supplies and building bombs. It's just they've boiled it down to this brilliant idea of making everything into the cards. Right. Every card in uh, Chain Reaction is a multi-use card. So your cards are your workers, but they're also the production buildings yeah. that you'll be using those workers in. Uh, and they're also the actions that you might be taking. So each card can do at least two things. And what you do on your turn is you've got your hand of cards and you sort of plan your chain. You might use one card for a couple of workers that then power factory that then generates some resources and uh, you might use extra workers to train even more and you then use resources and workers to create bombs or, or load bombs which is what you're you're, you're doing uh, and so you create these sort of cascades of, of cards that are being played a couple of different ways one into the next yeah. uh, in the same way that you might over the course of many turns uh, create a, a chain of events in a worker placement game to, to yeah. produce an effect. It's really satisfying to build the chains, and that's why I like this one more than the original. Oh? Yeah. Um, in the original, there was a lot of contention. You could get blocked from doing certain things, and it really it broke your, your strategy. Here, broke your chain. Yeah. <laughs> you, here you can plan out everything you want while you're holding your cards, and then on your turn, you just bust it all out. And, and and that is really, uh, really satisfying. Yeah. There is still contention because you can still take actions that will maybe steal uh, supplies or, or cards from, from the other players. But by and large, uh, what you have here is a game that sort of focuses more on the building aspect yeah. uh, rather than the sort of like... It's, it's a different kind of strategy yeah. rather than the like, oh, how do I place so that I don't get messed with, what happens if they take a thing that I need, yeah. or whatever. That's that's sort of a change in tone that really facilitates this reduction, this distillation uh, in, in its, in, into being something really successful. Yeah. And this is the deluxe version because we backed the Kickstarter, so we've got a slightly larger box and we've got some component bits, but the regular version of the game is literally just a deck of cards. There are even multi-use resource cards that let you track how much yellow cake and uranium uh, you've got uh, in your supply so that you know how much you can use to build the big bombs. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it really portable and it's fantastic to take, you know, out yeah. game nights. Yeah, this is li it it takes a game that literally uh it takes up the entire table um and uh, a good chunk of time and it turns it into a game that you could literally play on a plane. I wouldn't do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, Building uh, bombs on a plane, probably a bad idea. Yeah, the customs, uh, arresting customs officers were pretty clear on the fact that we shouldn't uh, <laughs> use that language if yeah. we're going to do that anyway. 
overall, this is a really successful reduction of a really fun game. Yeah, it takes a bigger game and it reduces it in the right way. It doesn't take out the parts that are interesting. It doesn't remove uh, sort of the the heart of the game, but it instead uh, distills the components and it and it reduces the number of concepts to a really tight. Uh, portable, manageable package, uh, and I think it's just, uh, I think it's a really successful reinterpretation of a bigger yeah. game, uh, with a lot of little clever um, uh, design choices that back up that reduction. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. Yeah, same here. I'm Andrew, this is Jess, we're from Gameosity, we'll see you next game. Hey everyone, my name is Chris and this is the Teacher's Lounge. Now if you're like me, you're not fully convinced that the Narwhal isn't actually a Pokemon? But also, if you're like me, you probably teach a lot of board games to your friends and to your family. So the Teacher's Lounge is a place where we go over teaching recommendations so you can get into the fun of games quicker. Today we're talking about uh, a lot of game in a little box. And even though Burgle Bros would fit that category, I'm going to talk about its sequel. So in Burgle Bros, you are a group of elite thieves trying to rob three floors of a building and escape scot-free from the helicopter pad on the top. Don't worry, the guy that you're stealing from is probably a bad guy. I don't know, like, hates puppies, plays Wonderwall at parties and stuff. He's a bad guy. Don't worry about it. Probably. In the direct sequel, right, that follows the storyline, you, in Fugitive, are the fugitive, and you have just cracked the case, uh, cracked the safes, and you're now on the top of this building and escaping from the marshal who's come to bring you to justice, because after all, reasons. I'm sure that you're not a bad guy. You're probably fine. In Fugitive, which is now the sequel, it's an entirely card-driven hidden movement game. The player who is the fugitive is trying to play these cards in order to connect from zero, which you can see on the art is the top of the building, right? Uh, all the way to 42, flying away without any problem at all. However, the marshal is trying to guess these card locations. You may be playing these face down, of course, right? And the marshal has to guess them and then eventually flip them over. The marshal wins if she guesses every one of your hiding locations. The trick is, as the fugitive, you're playing cards to try and, uh, you know, progress the sequence. And you can play cards that are up to three values higher. So you could start at the five, and so I could play a six, seven, or eight. But if you want to expedite that run, if you want to expedite that process, let's say I want to run to the 10, I have to play another card with it and use its sprint value. Cards either have a sprint value of one or of two. So let's say I'm going to do that. I'm going to use this card to sprint two extra spaces. So instead of being able to move to a max of eight, I'm going to move to 10. And I'm going to slip this face down like that. Now the marshal knows she has to guess this location and I've used this to sprint. So the marshal is trying to guess. The marshal also gets to draw from these same stacks of cards that the fugitive gets to and has a secret hand and she uses this awesome, cute, cute little notepad, notepad like in, uh, like in Blue's Clues, to check off different cards that she has. That way she can, you know, uh, keep track of that. The fugitive doesn't know that she has the 12 and the 34 and the 40 in hand and so he has to hope that she's not you know, cueing down, cluing down and figuring out exactly what's there. So on her turn, she'll make the guesses and stuff. This could be a bluff. Maybe I didn't need to play it. Maybe it's a double bluff, right? Who knows what exactly what it is, but it's a very fun game. It's so much fun, and it feels like one of those uh, Scotland Yard type hidden movement games, but just uh, two players, head to head, and just with cards. So without like a big unwieldy map to worry about. So what's my teaching recommendation for this game? When you're playing these two-player type of head-to-head -head games, typically if you're the one teaching it, you're probably more experienced and better than someone who's playing it for the first time. So my recommendation is if you're teaching someone new, then just ask them, hey, do you want me to play as tough and hard as I can? Or do you want me to play just a little more relaxed and we'll just have fun? Because some people say, oh, you should always try and crush the other person. How can they get better if you don't do that? Well, not everyone likes that style. Other people say, hey, you should always be a little bit nicer when you play with someone for the first time. Not everyone likes that either. So which way should you do? Just ask the person you're teaching. What do they prefer? That way, if you crush them or if they win on their first time or whatever it is, 
then that's what the expectation was, or that's closer to what the expectation was at the start of the game. Then everyone will have more fun, and if someone, you know, felt crushed but they asked for it, then maybe they're more likely to play it again. And after all, I think that when you teach games, you're just trying to make sure that that person has the most fun they can. So that's my recommendation. Just ask, set the expectation up front. My name is Chris, this is the Teacher's Lounge. Thanks for coming by. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. I'll be responding below under the name Meeple Overboard, a gaming podcast that my wife and I do together. Go check it out. Thanks for watching. Have a great one. Hi, welcome to Bickering Over Board Games, where we talk about topics, trends, and things in board gaming and how we feel about them. The topic for the blender this week is reduce, so it's meant to be like um, games that make a lot with a little, uh, I guess is one way of putting it, so you know games that don't have too many components or they have just the right amount of components or they have a lot of gameplay given the amount of components they have and we struggled with this for a little, a little bit Yeah. Uh, and then it occurred to me uh, that we did have one game in the house that was the ultimate in this category and it's a 52 card deck and I just want to take a minute here to discuss the underappreciated 52 card deck which has in its chambers and its chambers yeah sure uh, cards Board. infinite amounts of games in fact I was just at the tabletop conference here in Utah and James Ernest the uh, game designer was was just showing us all a game that he had invented and sold to a casino. It's like a kind of cross between. Oh, cool shuffling! It is very satisfying to <laughs> shuffle. Um, it was a cross between poker and blackjack, and it was we had a blast playing it. And growing up, I pretty much only played card games. We have a family card game called Pedro that we play, um, and I think I've reluctantly roped Brett into playing it at least twice. One time he was victorious, one time he was not. I played more than that, and no, I think I've been victorious more than once. at the family reunion you weren't victorious because you but were embarrassed. It, but I've played it more than once yeah, with your family. It's pretty fun, and I mean there is just hearts, spades. Um, Trick-taking games is like huge in 52 card decks. Yeah. It almost begs the question, do we need a game that is a trick-taking game, even though it's beautiful. And um, when we have this at our disposal, there's a bunch of trick-taking games in here. Yeah, or I mean, even just talking about games that you can replicate with a card deck, we were visiting my grandparents in Arizona and Brett figured out how to play Lost Cities with a deck of cards and then taught my grandpa, which he didn't remember. Um, well, you win some, you lose some. I would argue that actually an actual copy of Lost Cities would have probably been easier oh, to yeah, remember. Oh, yeah, the colors fiction. and yeah, everything. Okay. So this sort of begs the question, uh, do we need so many games? I mean, we could just get by on... Okay, that was quick. Uh, we could just get by on a 52-card deck. So I guess in the spirit of reduce, what are some games that we could maybe get rid of? Chaos Ball. Uh, <laughs> I knew you were going to say Chaos Point. Also, Sons of Anarchy. I don't particularly care for that game. Um, <sighs> but I spent so much time painting on the I also Mocha. think that um, maybe some of the Dead of Winter expansions. No. Off the table. <laughs> oh, whatever. Out of the question. No, Dead we've, of Winter. No, we've talked about this before. Look, do you want to keep Dead of Winter? Yeah. Let me keep all of it. <laughs> okay, I will indulge your vanilla Dead of Winter game sessions, but... I'm not getting rid of all those hard-earned characters. The main ones that I had a big beef with, you've gotten rid of. Like what? That one that we just gave to Claire. DC uh, deck building game. Yeah, and then replaying it with her, I didn't, I didn't miss it. Didn't miss it. No, I just wish that they had come out with a Watchmen standalone, and then I would have maybe kept that. We all do. Well, that's a great uh, place to end it because, um, you know, deck building games, how many do you need? We didn't need that many. No, we really didn't. To reducing. Right. To reducing and, yeah, give your friendly 52 card deck a go. Keep it in your car. Do you have any threes? I do. Okay. <laughs>
For today's quirky game, we're going to be talking about Traders of Osaka. This game, published by Z-Man Games a few years ago, and in fact a reprint uh, from an original design with a slightly different name, is a shipping game. It's a purchasing game. It's one in which you are going to be using the components provided to gather money, buy goods, advance the fleet that is moving along the ocean to deliver those goods, and when they finally arrive at port, avoiding pirates along the way, uh, by the way, you want to try to do that, then you are going to deliver those goods and make victory points. All of this is happening with just a tiny little board, as you can see here, deck of cards, and very few components. That's it. That's everything. I just showed you all the components in the game, except, of course, for the rule book. And so these cards, being at the heart of the game, are going to do quite a few different things for you. They are money in your hand. So, for example, here's five coins. Over here we have two coins, things like that. They are also the goods you purchase, because as you are taking these cards from display into your hand, they become money, and then once you've got a few of those, you can spend them to buy goods. Also for the amount listed on the cards, but as you take those, you put them in front of you, and they will be the good listed on the center of the card. Purchasing those will also move along the ships of the matching color along the route that they are taking in order to deliver those goods. And then when a ship finally makes it to port, those goods are going to be delivered and you're going to make victory points based on the values of the cards and the color and how many of those cards there are. A little bit of multiplication happens there, very simple multiplication, and you figure out how many points you're going to get, which again is these cards. You simply keep these and uh, store them for scoring at the end. There's also some special symbols on the cards. They come in five, three, and two coins, and different colors, of course. The five is just a five and the good, but the three and the two allow you to spend the card to uh, secure some goods as they are traveling along the waters. You can take those goods. Let's say I've got this card here in front of me. I'm worried about it being raided by pirates. So I can discard this from my hand, turn this card sideways, and it will no longer be raided by pirates. How do you get raided by pirates? If you are in a bad spot along the track when one of the ships finally makes it to port. So it's all about timing. How many goods you buy, of what color, uh, how much of the advance when you buy those goods. You don't want a ship showing up at port when your other ship that you are invested in is in one of those dangerous areas. And so there's just a lot going on. It's a game with very tricky timing. It's a game that has kind of a quirky sensibility. It's a little bit strange to get into. It's definitely hard to figure out how to do well, something I'm still working on myself. And some of the mechanisms that they provide you in the game really do help to enhance that feeling of solid timing, being careful with what you do and when you do it. You see there's a future market of cards and a current market of cards. Those future market uh, cards are going to move down and become the current cards at some point when that when that original set is, is uh, gone, either purchased or taken into the player's hands as money. You also have a token that you are going to be able to put out there on any card, uh, the, the current or the future market, to lock that card down. That's yours. You're guaranteeing that. You can take it later on as money, or you can buy it. But only you can buy it. In fact, the other players, if they want to buy the lot, simply ignore that card. That might trigger a player buying out the entire lot because now it's cheaper. And that might happen before you expected it to, because they can afford it now. And so just having all of these gears sort of turning in a, in a beautiful symphony, knowing when you should do something, how to go about it, denying a play a card that you may not necessarily need, but you want it gone. You don't want them to buy it or take it as money. It's a very interesting, clever game. Works really well at three players, especially. That's what I've found. So, Traders of Osaka is a very enjoyable card game. It's one that is bigger in its feel and scope and play than the box would lead you to believe. And I certainly recommend it. I'm not sure, to be honest, how available this is, but if you're looking for a quirky game that does a lot with very little, then Traders of Osaka is a good one for that. 
take a look at it, look into it, and I hope if you do play it, that you enjoy it. I'm Z Garcia, thanks for checking this out. Hey guys, what up? I am Ben, and we are talking... I am talking board games. As you can see, Tommy is once again not here, still off gallivanting, who knows where. So, uh, we'll make do. Anyways, today on Blender, we are looking at reduce... Reducing... Re... Re... We're looking at games with very few components. And the game that I have chosen for you is none other than, oh my goods, oh my goods, is a little tiny card game uh, by Alexander Pfister, where you are using just cards to uh, assign workers to buildings, to create resources that you're going to turn into money, that you're going to build more buildings that generate different resources that you can combo with other resources to generate more money and so forth until the end of the game. It is a uh, really big engine building game in a very little box. So, without further ado, let us con It's not the same. So uh, I guess we'll just consider the comments. Anyways, first up we have New Killer Star 27 He rated the game a 2, stating pure Euro trash. Convert resources into buildings and score points. The game. Yawn. Oh, it actually kind of made me yawn a little bit. Uh, New Killer Star, you were not incorrect in that. It is... I don't know if I'd call it Euro Trash, but... Uh, it's convert resources into buildings and score points. The game. That is, that is all there is to it. It's just a card-based game where you're creating buildings and scoring points based off what you can convert resources from. So... Yeah, not going to argue with you there. Uh, sorry you didn't like it. Let's go ahead and check out someone who did like it. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Life is a Hologram. Ooh. He rated it a 9.5, and he stated, Best pocket card game ever. And I have to agree with him as well. As far as small, compact games go... This is probably one of the better ones I've found. It's got a playtime of 30 minutes, plays two to four players, and it packs a punch uh, in that amount of time. Uh, so yeah, pocket card game, good call. Um, but let's uh, just expand a little bit on this. So the game was originally made. It had some complaints by people. They came out with a revised rule set, which really added a lot to the game. Go check out uh, Tom's re-review. Guys, he does not do re-reviews. But he re-review... Re that's like a tongue twister. He re-review... <laughs> he looked at a second time, oh my goods, just to uh, really point out the changes that it made to the gameplay and his opinion of the game. But uh, for me, the idea that it just uses cards and nothing but cards to be your workers, your buildings, your money, your goods, everything is a little bit much. And so what I actually did is I picked up the expansion, which adds, well, more cards to it, but adds a lot more to the game. You now have random events, you have uh, new cards that are characters that get added into the deck. But actually what I did, because I didn't fit the box anymore, I went and got my own little deck box. And if you look here... I actually have a whole bunch of dice that uh little tiny d6s that i store and i use these as the goods so you just put it on top of the card and then you just kind of use it like a spin down life counter as you uh, exhaust the money or create more of the good and it has worked really well it takes away that kind of gimmicky card as resource aspect of the game and i've been really happy with it and it feels less of a reduce read Less of a game with fewer components and more of an actual game. And as you can see, it's still very compact with the expansion in there. But uh, in the end, I highly recommend Oh My Goods. Go check it out if you're looking for possibly the best pocket card game ever. Anyways, thanks for watching. Be sure to like, share, comment, subscribe to the Dice Tower. They are the best. And uh, enjoy the rest of Blender. We'll see ya. Bye.
Hi, I'm Ilka, the Happy Loser's wife. We already have enough board games, so everything my husband wants to buy from now on will have to be approved by me. Welcome to The Pitch. You love Agricola, right? Ah, uh, I do. I do. I have so many fond memories. Yeah, uh, we played it when I was in labor, and um, so we can never get rid of it. And also, we have all this stuff. You bought uh, a tray, and you bought these uh, realistic um, tokens, like we have pumpkin and we have wood. But what you don't like, and maybe that's the reason we haven't played it a lot uh, lately, is because every time when you start a new round, you have to do th so much bookkeeping, setting up for oh, the yeah, next yeah, round. Yeah. Put the putting the resources, resources on, on, and then the... we miscount it, and then we're like, oh, did we already do this? Yeah, I hate that. Yeah. That's... So how about we have a game by the same designer, Uwe Rosenberg, but that is set in a monastery. Ora et labora. Uh, that's Latin. I know Latin. And what does it this, mean? It uh, means a pray and work. Mm -hmm. And I pray you're not pitching me here uh, to buy another game. <laughs> well, I am. Because in this game, you have no setup between rounds. It's, it's basically the same game. So you know you're going to love it. But there's a rondelle. And instead of adding stuff to the new, new board, each round you just floop. You, you floop? You floop. You floop? Yes, you floop. Okay, floop. Uh, fl normally, I'm all for flooping. And the, then you know, thing, if then... you take that resource, you, you, you the rondelle will tell you how many of those resources you'll get. And every turn, it gets more and more and yeah, more. Yeah, so, sounds smart. But so get rid of two other games and I'm in. Okay, how about I tell you, my name is in the rule book. What? No way. What? How? Yeah, Why? I, I play tested it. My, my name is so, really in the rule so book. So you're saying Dave... Luza, as in first and last name, which is also my last name, is in the rule book? Yep. Well... Cool, right? It's really cool. So that's a sale. Thank you! Aura and Labora come into the Luza household with a great rondelle. Hello and welcome. Table for two? Great, have a seat. I'm Rafa, your waiter, and on today's special, we have Valley of the Kings, a delicious deck builder stew that has been reduced to just the necessary components, I mean ingredients. It's a small bowl, but it'll feed to just right. Valley, Valley of, the, of kings. the Kings. Now the startup of the game is rather simple. You'll take your 10 starter cards, which are level one. You'll shuffle those and that'll be your starter deck. You'll then make the market, dividing the level three cards from the level two cards. You'll shuffle the level two cards and the level three cards separately, and then stack them to where the level two cards are on top. You then sacrifice one here to the boneyard, and you'll build your pyramid from bottom up. And you're only allowed to buy cards from the bottom of, or the base of the pyramid. When you buy a card, the ones on top crumble to fill in the gaps. If you buy on the right, that happens. If you buy on the left, this happens. And if you buy in the middle, you get to choose which of the two come down. You're gonna want to leave the one that you want on top hoping your opponent gives you access to it later. This creates beautiful tension throughout the entire game as you're gonna wanna buy a certain card on the bottom but block your opponent from a card on the top. You'll be thinking of ways and using the actions of cards to try to maneuver this uh, market. Entombing is the second unique mechanic that really takes this game to the next level. You see, you only score cards in your tomb and you only get to entomb cards once per turn, besides effects, and no cards in your deck score any points whatsoever. Now, the way the scoring works is, starters all give you one victory point, unique cards will tell you how many victory points they score at the bottom, and the set collection gives you exponential growth, as the more of each number of the set you have, they're gonna get multiplied by each other or squared, and you'll get your victory points. So one of my favorite parts about the game is the mid game. Once that gets going, 
you'll start to really be making intricate decisions. Do you generate the gold? Do you do the sweet action? Maybe building some crazy combos? Or do you start entombing cards? There's no right or wrong here. It's all about your preference. I love deck builders, but this one specifically lets me really customize my deck. I want to take a second just to talk about the art and flavor text. These are actual real relics and artifacts found in ancient Egypt and each card will have a flavor text for example this heart scarab amulet this amulet was placed in the wrappings of mummies it protected the heart which was left in the body during mummification each time you play this game you'll have a little history lesson of ancient Egypt I even like to play Egyptian music and suddenly I'm a pharaoh, I'm a pharaoh planning, planning for the for afterlife, the afterlife. There's so much game in such a little box. It plays beautifully at two and I highly recommend it. Soon enough you'll find your own favorite strategies in cards. There are even a couple of standalone games that are sort of expansions as they can be mixed in with this one once you're ready for more. Best of all, today's special comes at a reduced price. So check this one out next time you're looking for a table for two. here and today I am going to show Nora a game where it is all about creating the most beautiful artwork so that Master Hukasai is going to fall in love with you and your beautiful paintings. <gasps> I've always wanted to be a painter. Done! Are you sure Nora? Huh? Okay, Nora, so in this game, you are going to try to make the most beautiful paintings. And of course, one of the most important things is to make sure that your painting is harmonious. Mm. How do you think we are going to achieve that, Nora? Um, a lot of colors? A lot of colors, yes, those are very important. But it is of course important that you're not going to use just purple and orange and all these colors that are going to clash. You want colors that work together. <laughs> so <laughs> the most important thing that you want to make sure is that you go for certain diplomas. Maybe you want different people on your painting, or maybe you want different buildings or just the most trees. But you cannot do everything, so you have to focus on some things. Every round is going to start by us putting these cards on this beautiful bamboo mat. It's really nice, Ooh, right? It's so beautiful! Just like with sushi. Just like with sushi, right? To keep in a Japanese theme. And uh, you are going to put the cards first in the first row. Then every player can choose if he wants the card or if he wants to wait and see if there are more cards that are going to be interesting because you are going to take a whole column of cards but maybe you are going to get a card that you cannot even place so maybe it's smarter to just take the card right now or wait and see what else there is going to be so Nora do you want to wait or do you want to take the card immediately now? I want this card. You want that card, okay. So, on every card there is a piece of painting and there is a piece that you're going to use for your work, for your workspace. So, this painting says that you need green paint and at the moment you only have grey paint because you are just a novice and you don't have enough money to buy all those beautiful painting colors. So, you can choose at the moment you cannot paint this because you don't have the appropriate colors to paint so you have to put it upside down in your workspace and now you have green paint so for the next time you are going to be able to paint something with your green paint but I don't like green but now you can use it to make beautiful colors you need it for nature and for nature and for trees no there's not real paint in there put it down Nora has a lot of greens, so she's not that happy right now. And she's not really loving the game because she only has greens in her workspace. <laughs> but lucky for her, now there is a card that needs two greens. So are you going to be a little bit more excited now, Nora? 
Yeah. Let's turn that frown upside down. We're playing games, it's fun. But your painting is pretty. Your painting is pretty as well. You are pretty. You belong here, Nora. It's all okay. Okay, Nora, do you want to continue? Or do you want to stop? I don't know. You want an extra card? It has a person on it. <gasps> and you need a person. It probably has a person. Okay, I cannot promise it. Okay. There's no person on it. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Nora. Nora got the three different animals before me. So she's going to get the seven points. Yay! Or not so yay for me. Nora, I, I cannot believe it myself. But after all those times that I've lost to you, I think now is the moment that I've actually won. I've already recounted it like five times. But I cannot believe it. But, but I, I think I won. Well, I won. I'm I won. I won. 27 points in your face! Haha! <laughs> Who's the gamer sister now? Well, I'm gonna be a painter in real life. <laughs> yeah, I win. Howdy folks, welcome to Two Player Showdown. I'm Hunter, this is Rebecca, and today we're looking at San Juan, a great little card game. Yes, and one thing that we like about this particular game is that the cards have multiple uses. And we really like things that have multiple uses, so we're going to talk a little bit about these cards. So in San Juan, the cards, cards, cards can be used for three, count them, three different things. They are used to build buildings. They also represent your resources in the game. And they act as the money you use to build the building. Say it ain't so. It's so. So this game plays two to four players, lasts 45 minutes to an hour. It's really quick. And with the low, low price of about $25, you don't even need this box. You could throw it into a Ziploc baggie. But does it really fit in a Ziploc bag? Let's see. Here's the score sheet, all the cards. Here's a pencil. Even the even the even all the other stuff and the expansion that comes in the game. Included in the game. <laughs> it doesn't... It doesn't quite... <laughs> a Ziploc bag. Maybe a larger quart bag. Maybe I'll put the score sheet sideways. Anyway, regardless of whether you carry it in the box or in a baggie, this game packs a lot of punch with just a few components. Wait, wait, wait for it! Wait for it! You forgot <laughs> the instructions. Who needs instructions? But wait! There's more! Tell us about the two-player variant. The two-player variant is simply this. Instead of taking only one action a turn, the person who's the governor, the start player for the round, takes two actions. This game is awesome, and you should check it out. Thanks so much for joining us today. Cool. Hey. San Juan. Hey friends of the blend. Today we have been tasked with finding a game that makes the most out of very few components. For us, We've selected Wibble Plus Plus from Stuff by Bez. Now, Wibble Plus Plus is really interesting because not only is it a game, but it's also a system that you can use to play all kinds of different games from. So it's like a deck of cards, but instead of having suits and numbers, you've got letters and patterns. So you can make all kinds of different games from it. This actually comes with a few different cards with rules for different games that have already been made. So you've got Wibble, which is a card game where you're using the letters to try and find words. You've got Fable, which again uses the letters, but instead you're all telling a story together. And then you've got Grabble. This uses both the letters and the patterns, and it's about matching them up. And it's just this real-time mad dash <laughs> rush. A lot of fun. And that's just a few examples. There's tons more that come with the game, but there's also a lot online because the de designers are always coming up with new stuff mm -hmm. and fans are creating things and it all gets shared on there. But you can always get creative and think of some yourself. 
I really like Wibble. I think it's fascinating, it's a really interesting system, and it's just like a deck of cards in that the possibilities are endless. Like, if someone had have made this before they made a standard deck of cards, this could be what everyone knows as a deck of cards today. Yeah, absolutely. Now, do you have any games that have just very few components but does a lot with it? If so, we'd love to hear about it. You can leave it in the comments below. Or if you're interested in more board game discussions with us, then you can always check us out on our social media. But until next time, we'll see you later. Bye. Bye. And that's going to do it for us on this episode, everybody. A big thanks to all my contributors, as always. A big thanks to you for tuning in and checking out the episode. As I've said before, if you yourself would like to be a possible part of our little board game blender family, then drop me an email. Let's talk about it. Send me a demo of your idea. All of that good stuff. So I'll see you uh, very soon. In a couple of weeks, we'll have our new episode up. And as always, hey, stay a friend of the blend. I'll see you.